families, when they have children at school, when uh, they need that stability to be able to send their kids to the same school knowing that they're not going to be thrown out at two months' notice or they're going to have to move house every six months or every year, which unfortunately is the reality for uh, people in the private rented sector. And there are now over one million households with children privately renting. So I think this is just one indication of the scale of the problem that that wider affordability crisis is generating. Um, just to skip back one, you know, it's on this line, this is a historic line, showing the way that um, earnings and private rents up until about 2007 so, uh, actually tended to keep pretty close track of each other. You know, dare I say it, you could even say this is a kind of market working because um, people's ability to pay is actually, you know, more or less tracking uh, what they're being asked to pay. Fine. Uh, unfortunately, that no longer works either because as a result of the, um, this massive pressure on the private rented uh, sector, as more and more people are priced out of home ownership and um, social housing is flogged off and not replaced, rents are now going up through the roof. And again, you will have seen the headlines recently. Uh, Shelter released a study the other week that demonstrated um, in 55% of local authority areas in the country, average rents are above the affordability threshold, which is deemed to be about 35% of income. Okay. And in fact, it's much, much worse than that because there are many parts of the country, especially in London, where average rents are well over 50% of average earnings. And again, anecdotally, I mean, just looking around this room, I imagine there's quite a few people here who live in the private rented sector. Um, and I imagine quite a few of you are e either are or know people who are spending well over half of your disposable income just to keep a roof over your head. And you don't tend to get an awful lot for that either. In the long run, what this means is um, a catastrophic collapse in home ownership and a, and a meteoric rise in the private rented sector. This is um, a projection, so, you know, treat with caution, but on current trends, this is where we are headed in terms of uh, the main 10 years. The, the thick blue line is um, home ownership for those under 30 years old, um, fairly kind of precipitous decline, but m matched almost exactly by um, a rapid rise in private renting. And if that's the younger generation coming through, what that means is that whole generation is not going to be able to access home ownership. One of the other impacts of high rents is it means that, of course, people aren't able to save for a deposit. Um, the Resolution Foundation pointed out recently that whereas you used to have to realistically save carefully for about eight years to get uh, a deposit for a house, we're now looking at about 45 years. Right? Um, what that means is that, it, uh, that the age of the average first-time buyer is going up. At the moment, it's actually going up more or less one, um, 10 years every 10 years, which means that no one's getting out the other end. Right? So we have a really um, systematic shift in the tenure balance in this country. Uh, and that has some pretty serious consequences. Not just because you know, home ownership is seen to be a good thing, uh, but because it actually uh, gets into some fairly complicated distributional effects. You know, all those people who are renting privately are effectively paying off the mortgages of people who already own homes. So that dynamic is meaning that, that over time, more and more money is being taken from those who are working or, uh, you know, in other words, in other ways, um, gathering an income to channel into the mortgage repayments for a, handful, uh, for a, a much smaller minority of people who increasingly own all of the property. Now, there used to be a term for this system which has rather fallen out of fashion, but we used to call it feudalism. Um, <laughs> and under feudalism, yeah, access to landed property was um, only accessible through inheritance. And that is actually pretty much the way we're going now. The, 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 uh, those, what little analysis has been done this, and unfortunately it's not enough, demonstrates that the few people who are able to access um, a mortgage and buy their very first home, first-time buyers, half of them turn out not really to be first-time buyers at all, or getting up to half of them now, either people who um, owned a property once before or have returned from abroad, or you know, they, they, actually, they, they are already on the housing ladder in some sense. And the other half are increasingly people who are uh, helped out by the bank of mum and dad. In other words, inheritance is once again becoming the only way in which you can actually access property ownership. Um, so that's a quick look at uh, the tenure patterns. What does this mean um, and what that means for individuals? What it means for um, society as a whole is more problematic. This is um, a classic, uh, this, is, this is a picture, not a, not a graph. It's, um, it's purely illustrative, ripped off uh, one of my favorite websites, housepricecrash.com, um, <laughs> which demonstrates the, the kind of the classic anatomy of a bubble. Uh, in a previous life, I used to teach financial history at LSE, and, um, and I always used to teach my students that there were, there, there were only two iron laws in financial history. The first is that bubbles always burst, which is fairly obvious. The second is more interesting, and it's that every time there's a bubble, people say, this time it's different. Right? And in fact, I was quite annoyed that Kenneth Rogoff nicked that as, um, as the title for his book. Um, 
Because again, where they're doing the last boom and, and uh, leading up to the bust, again, people said, this time it's different, this time it won't bust. The fundamentals have changed, it's a new paradigm. And that's simply what this, this um, graph rather neatly demonstrates. That right up at the top there, people start saying new paradigm. Um, for what it's worth, I think we're actually now possibly in that kind of bull trap moment where we've had a bit of a, of a, of a bust in house prices, but it, they started to creep up again. Everyone thinks, oh, brilliant, we're going back to normal and they'll just you know, shoot off again. Um, I fear that is probably wrong because, unfortunately, the, iron, the first iron law um, still holds. Is there a problem with house price booms? I mean, you know, if not if you read the Daily Mail, right? Um, <laughs> Rising house prices are surely an unalloyed good for everybody because obviously everyone's a mortgage homeowner, um, apart from some riffraff we don't care about. And, um, and surely, you know, all these people benefit from having their asset values going up so dramatically. And of course, you know, it is true. It's pretty good for quite a lot of people. The majority of households are homeowners, right, in some form or other. Still, it's declining, but we're still over, t uh, still at about two thirds. So in that case, in that sense, surely rising house prices are a good thing. Um, well, no, they're not. Firstly. Rising house prices inevitably mean higher debts. Very few of those people are able to buy those homes just with money they haven't had lying around. I mean, not many people have the quarter of a million pounds you need to buy a home um, just in their back pocket, which means they're borrowing it. So, we ha so as a, again, I'm sure I don't need to tell this room, um, we have an, a, a mounting debt crisis driven very largely by mortgage debts. Um, we've talked about the affordability crisis and how effectively this is pricing out a whole generation of people. Um, well, I talked a little bit about how private renting is effectively channeling wealth from those who are younger and, and earning to those who are asset rich but effectively sitting on assets. This is also true of the house price gain. Whenever there is a house price boom, effectively what that is doing is channeling money from those who are uh, younger and poorer and working into the pockets of those who are um, effectively asset rich and sitting on, on a valuable asset. This is simply because house price growth is a zero sum game. Right? It's not like the productive economy where, you know, if my business grows, that doesn't mean somebody else's has to go out of business. You know, GDP can grow. You know, if I manage to employ 10 more people, that doesn't mean somewhere else 10 more people have to lose a job. There is real growth. That's a positive sum game. House prices are not like that because ultimately houses don't generate anything. They are actually rotting assets. They get worse over time. They require money to up, uh, keep them up. Um, they don't produce anything at all. So when house prices go up, that just means money has to come from somewhere else in the system to feed that inflation. Uh, where does it come from? Well, it comes from other people who are trying to buy into the system, and it comes, crucially, from debt. Um, what that means is that, effectively, we are redistributing money very effectively through the housing system, away from the poor towards the rich, away from the young towards the old, and actually geographically as well, away from poorer parts of the country to richer parts of the country. Um, I also think this has a really pernicious effect on culture. You, know, you only have to look at crap telly programs to realize just how kind of damaging this um, house price obsessiveness is to our culture. But most importantly, I think it actually generates this sense of unearned wealth. You know? Most people who have done well out of the housing boom have actually earned more by doing um, absolutely nothing and sitting on their assets than they have from actually going out to work. Um, the last point, I think, is one that's, that's made very rarely, but um, it should be stressed. We misallocate capital to, uh, capital to a colossal extent in our economy. You know? Why, why you know, we're constantly bemoaning the fact that there's nothing to put into um, to business, uh, to productive business. So why is it that the German uh, engineering sector is so much stronger than ours? Well, guess what? They put their money into companies that actually put, um, generate stuff and employ people rather than shoveling all of their available credit and capital into debt. Uh, What this means effectively is that um, not only do we uh, over-invest in, in uh, under-invest in productive sectors, it actually means we have higher unemployment. And again, uh, there's lots of techie stuff behind this, but it's been demonstrated through international studies that, um, that uh, increasing home ownership and increasing house, um, uh, kind of dependence on house price wealth uh, actually increase, in, um, increases uh, uh, unemployment by two percentage points in comparison to other countries. Um, and finally, it actually has very damaging impacts on supply. I won't go into this in any detail, but take my word for it. There's a complete perversity in the housing market that rising prices effectively mean 
you can't build any more homes. It's not like most markets where rising prices actually act as a signal to people to build more. They don't. Effectively, rising prices act as a block on anyone building more because of the way that the land market operates. But you'll be glad to hear I won't inflict that upon you. Um, so what are the solutions? Well, firstly, yeah, we do need to build more homes. Nothing, I, nothing I've said here should make you think we don't. We absolutely need more homes, um, but not because that will bring down prices, because it won't. We need to build more homes because we haven't got enough. Um, nowhere near enough. We're building less than half of what we need every year. Um, what do we need to, um, how do you do that? Well, there's a lot of crap at the moment about um, uh, the planning system being the problem, as though you know, the reason house price, um, ho housing development fell off a cliff three years ago was because the planning system had suddenly seized up. It's not. There's perfectly good reasons for, for a strong planning system. In fact, I'd argue you need a, a stronger one. The real question is actually on the demand side. It's not about supply. The reason house prices go up so much is all about demand. This is Kate Barker, who was commissioned by the last government to do this major study into all this. And, um, and she looked at the house, housing system in great detail and had, in, in her enormous report, which is, you know, very comprehensive, she had all of half a side on the demand side of the equation. And she identified um, four things. Uh, one, a cultural, the, the, the fuel house price demand. One, a cultural preference for home ownership. Again, I think you probably relabel that as a screaming obsession, but um, <laughs> she also identified a more responsive and competitive lending market, which again, I think is a bit euphemistic for the way that our uh, mortgage lending industry has behaved over the last 20 years. Um, the knowledge that housing is a good investment, and again, this is, a, this, is the, this is effectively the speculative cycle kicking in here. People are prepared to invest in housing because they, they expect it to go up in the future. Um, therefore, more people invest in it, therefore it does go up in the future, and thus the spiral starts. And finally, and most importantly for me, um, we've actually massively subsidised home ownership and have done for many years, since, since the 1960s. Uh, successive governments have taken the choices to remove tax, taxation on, housing, um, on uh, house price wealth, because we used to tax it, we don't anymore. Um, and actually start subsidising it through mortgage interest um, relief uh, first and then various forms of uh, subsidised owner occupation at the moment. Um, which I won't go through in any detail because I'm running out of time, but again, take my word for it, successive governments for 40 years have made the policy choice that we will subsidise home ownership above all else. And that's still reflected now. This graph is from um, a shelter study that actually just shows the effects of housing um, taxation, uh, tax breaks rather, because um, these are the, the, the blue lines, uh, the subsidies that go into social housing, uh, which are the pink lines, and uh, the, uh, the housing benefit that goes to those in the private rented sector by income group. What this effectively shows you is that uh, we subsidise people at the bottom end of the income scale in there through the housing system quite a lot because they're poor and they need housing benefit and social housing. But we also subsidise people at the top an awful lot by giving them fat tax breaks on their unearned wealth. Um, those in the middle, I, you know, most people, get pretty badly squeezed in this system. So, you know, if you wonder why we have a polarised housing market in this country, it's this, right? We've made the policy choices. These are all political choices that we choose to put all the money there and there, not in the middle. Well, you know, that's what you get. Um, so just to end up, going back to this uh, classic graph, there's a reason this starts in 1975, and there's, there's a reason why all of these graphs always start in about 1975. It's because before then, there weren't house price booms and busts. They just didn't exist. Houses um, tended to go up, uh, house prices tended to go up you know, pretty steadily in line with inflation, in line with earnings. It was a pretty boring industry, right? It didn't do much. Um, it started about then for two simple reasons. Firstly, the tax stuff that I mentioned. It was during the 60s that we, that we removed all of the taxation on housing wealth and started subsidising it. And secondly, because in the early 70s, the banking industry was deregulated and vast amounts of mortgage credit started to flood into the housing system. So, again, these are policy choices. <clears throat> we have this kind of rather sick sense that um, it's inevitable, that the housing system is just like that. It'll always be like that. It's not, it didn't used to be, it's not like this elsewhere. These are, every single one of these booms and busts has been driven by a very conscious and deliberate set of policy choices that we as a country really need to face up to if we're ever actually going to get to the bottom of the kind of fundamental problems in our housing market. Thank you.